going to give it a few minutes and let uh, make sure everybody gets in here. starting to get a few people in here um well i decided i've been having a lot of thoughts and discussions um with a few people and also reminded by um michael ward um about um there's vintage nibs and everybody's fight to uh get them so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, show you the differences and why vintage is different than uh, newly manufactured and um, also to dispel a bunch of the myths behind it. it it's, it it's, it's kind of ridiculous. So um, uh, give me a second. There we go. Um, the deal with vintage nibs is um, everyone fights for them, and they spend a lot of time, a lot of money on them. And there's no real absolute reason to have them. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you a quick, quick history of how they were made and how it differs. I'm, I would blocked one, yeah. Um, and so uh, here we go. I'm going to show you this. That's fine. Sorry about that, everyone. This is a uh, nib manufacturing chart. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it before, but this is um, how they were made. And that's what makes vintage nibs different is not these steps, but how these steps were accomplished. Um, the deal with this is vintage nibs are usually more consistent. Um, in other words, you get a box of nibs and most of them are good. And the reason, the reason that there's, they're all, um, good is the fact that every single one of these steps you see, these were handled by humans. Um, and that's just not possible today. So, you know, the, it was more consistent to get a good nib out of a box. So, for example, you take um, Gillette's factory, which um, in England, and they would have rooms, a warehouse full of rooms of people, primarily women and seamstresses, that would, in each step, touch that nib, examine the nib, pass it on to the next step, and it would go through many, 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 many hands. So you would have more consistent results. Um, and that's, that's my big issue of why I like using vintage nibs, but it's not necessarily. Today, yep, they are, uh, there are some of the toolings that are original. Um, they're stamped out of metal using some of the toolings. But the big thing is the grinding process and the, the final, final steps. It's done on a um, grinder. It's um, Glee Bar manufactures one of the types of grinders. Basically, it's two stones that go together, and the metal nib drops in there. It grinds it, and then it spits it out. So it's all automated. <laughs> no problem. Um, so it's, it's completely automated. And because of that, there's not someone checking every single nib for quality. And that's why you will get, say, a box of of Leonard principles and there will be issues in a batch you know it could be due to a tooling problem it could be to something else that's just going to be part of it and that's what we have to deal with because um, we we cannot hide there it's not possible to manufacture a, um, a a modern nib using all of the labor that they used back then we could we could do it but then it would drive the price of the nibs up so high so, um, what I want to do is, um, yeah, that's true. They, at least they are still being made. And, you know, there's, there's, I have not been to the museum. I wish, uh, I've never been to England, so 
Yeah. Um, and that's that's just part of it. There's going to be inconsistencies. See, and that's there's there's all these. Okay. One of the things that I see people do, I'm looking at all these questions and I'm going to answer it, is everyone says, okay, I got nib A and nib A had some problems, so I'm not going to use that anymore. You're going to have that. That's part of life now. There, there's no way around that. So the best way is to buy a bunch and you are going to have defective ones. If there is a bunch of defective ones, um, contact who you got them from and they'll return them. Uh, everyone that I know that sells nibs, they'll take returns on defective nibs. Um, it's just part of life now. Um, the big thing is that when, when you get a good nib out of a batch, which is in all honesty, one of the most, one of the modern day nibs I use is a Leonard principle. Leonard principle. I never have had issues with. Um, it, it's a great nib. It, performs just as well as a vintage nib um, maybe out of a box of you know the hundred that they're sold in I might pull out two or three that are bad and that's just going to be part of it you just have to live with it and the big thing is is quit chasing all the vintage nibs and quit paying ridiculous amounts for them there there is no no reason to pay thirty dollars for a nib it's disposable it's it's not worth that. It's, <laughs> there's no reason to. So if you're new to calligraphy, and this is primarily what I want to, uh, oh, I've seen, yeah, it's, you can buy, um, buy them by the hundred from uh, Paper and Ink Arts and John Neal Books. And actually, if you look at the price of the nibs on there, there's actually usually a quite a big break if you buy them by the gross or the hundred, depending on who the manufacturer is. Um, and it becomes much, much cheaper per nib when you buy by the gross. Um, you're going to be spending a little bit. If, if they are recommending vintage only, I, I honestly would have an issue with a teacher. Um, it, that's, there's no reason for that. So, anyhow... Um, so like, you know, the, the linen principle does the fine hairlines, does the, the thick shades, everything like that. Hi, hi Gail. Um, there's, let's, yeah, there's lots of people that haven't. Okay. All right. Boy, this is fun late at night. I've never had this issue. Anyhow, um, so as you're new, here's the thing. Um, do not worry about chasing vintage nibs. Um, there's no reason to. The, the vintage nibs are the quality. Yeah, Leonard Principle's great. The quality um, of, say, for example, a Jalop Principality. A, a Jalop Principality, to get the... Um, to get the, the fine hairlines out of it as a new calligrapher, you're not going to be able to do that. You're, you need to practice. And a vintage nib will not make you write like someone else. So if you see someone like, um, you know, um, John DeColibus uses uh, Jalot Principalities, it's not the principality that makes him write good. It's all of the hours he's invested in that, in practicing. So quit worrying about a nib you know it, it'd be kind of like I said this in a conversation earlier today it'd be kind of like you're wanting to learn piano and you're going to spend all of your time looking at all of the models of piano instead of actually sitting down and playing the keys you're not going to get good at it so there, there's no point in it find uh, one of the things I recommend is um, like paper and ink art sells um, for point and pen sells like a copper plate sampler that uh that copper plate sampler will give you a broad variety of a bunch of different pointed pin nibs, most of the most popular nibs, and you can try them and find one you like. You know, um, it's it, just find what you like. Don't worry about what someone else uses. There's there's millions and millions of different nibs in the world. You know, um, you, you just got to focus on practice. Because I don't care 
I don't care how nice of a nib you have. If you don't put the time in, if you don't put the practice, that nib's not going to do what you want it to do because your hand doesn't know how to do it. So that's my little feel for the new people. Um, well, you're going, and that's, that's the thing. It, it, and the other thing is, is each, each different nib, it may be, may, it may not be that the nib is defective. It may be that it, it needs a different angle of attack on the paper. It may be the different paper you're using. It could be a lot of different things. It's not necessarily defective. Um, there's no such thing as a, you know, a bad nib model. There, you may have defective nibs, but there's no such thing as a bad nib model. It's what you like. It's what you like to use. Okay, no problem. It'll be on replay for 24 hours. Yeah, the misalignment, that happens. And that's going to happen because you have this, you know, you have this machine trying to do these, these tiny, tiny little uh, delicate procedures that only a hand. So that's, that's the big thing. You know, don't spend all of your time. I, I've spent a lot of time and energy chasing vintage nibs. Um, Originally, it was so I could try them under the illusion that it would make me better, and it never made me better. <laughs> not, a, not a bit. So, and the other thing is, as I'm, you know, as I'm on Periscope and learning about, you know, and watching people do their different demonstrations, everyone always says, what nib are you using? What nib are you using? What nib are you using? It's not the nib that makes them good. Not at all. It's, it, it's the, uh, it's the time that they put in, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you see someone like David Grimes, David Grimes does wonderful Periscope broad. D yes, he did. And he were, Mike just reminded me of this. It's something that I've said a bunch. So, you know, it's, it, D anyway, David does all, does wonderful and grosser script. And I see, when I watch his scopes, I watch, see everyone going, what nib are you using? What nib are you using? What nib are you using? That's, that's not why he does such nice lettering. It's because he's put time. It's because he's put effort. It's because he's put energy. It's not because he has a Jalot principality, you know. <sighs> How do you find your nib? That's a good question. Okay. First suggestion would be, like I said, get that sampler. Um, no, don't worry about the vintage kinds. If you're just starting to write, it's all trial and error. That's a correct. That's absolutely a correct. Um, you you need to just try different nibs. It doesn't need to be vintage. Try a bunch of different ones. It's that's going to where how you're going to find it. It's all trial and error. So, yeah, you can catch it on the replay. I'll leave this up for 24 hours. Um, it's all trial and error is what I'm getting at, though. You know, you sit down. If, if you know someone that use a different, um, if you know someone that use a different nib than you do and they haven't tried yours, swap, you know. Um, just try a bunch of nibs. There's wonderful modern nibs. Yes, right. That's correct. You know, if, if you like flexible, then that's what you go for. And don't consider that, you know, flexible is necessarily vintage because that isn't the case. You know, I can take, uh, I've got a few out here. Let me grab an EF principle, and I want to show you something. Hopefully, we can see this on Periscope. And your chase, tastes do change. Okay, I'm going to find my camera, and I'm going to see if we can get in here. Okay, this is the EF principle, and I'm over-flexing it a bit, but you can see how wide that is. That is a modern nib. Now, I can take, I'll grab a principality. This is a Jalot principality, and same deal. Look, it didn't flex anymore. And I'm over flexing this one. It's it's very, very similar. So that whole 
you got to have a principality. You got to have a 604 EF is bull. <laughs> that's that's all there is to it. You know, they're flexible. They're fine pointed. It's a lot of just sitting and trying. So, you know, and like I said in the beginning of this, uh, the, the biggest difference is the fact that it passed through many, many hands and your, your quality in out of each, every single nib in a box of vintage is going to be better. And that's the truth. Not that it's a better nib than a newly manufactured, that you're going to have more consistent quality. <laughs> Got my thoughts. Um, and the other thing is you're going to go broke trying to find all of these, you know, and people spending that much money, it's crazy. So, yeah, Blanzy 2552, that's a vintage nib. It's an affordable nib, and people go, well, it's a cheap nib, so it must not be good. That's a wonderful nib. And that's absolutely right, you know. In order to – there's an analogy um, – that Brian Walker says, quality of times. There, there's slight differences, and that's because of the grinding. But the analogy that Brian Walker uses is, is he writes with a, um, a butterfly touch. That's when the principality may help you a little bit. The, the way it's explained is the fact that the ink is touching the paper and not the nib itself. Um, and there are very few people in the world that write with that kind of quality um, that that may help them with. That's exactly it. That's when you get to that quality, it's, it's like writing on the surface of water. And a vintage nib isn't going to help you get to that quality of writing. So, you know, find a modern production nib, one that you can always have, never run out of, that you like. Like for me, it's the Leonard Principle. That's that's my go-to modern nib. I use it quite often. Um, so, and spend your time practicing instead of chasing supplies and paying so much money for them. It's, it's just not worth it. If you can't get them at a good price, skip it, move on. Yeah, Etsy and eBay. If you go onto my website, I have this big, long, drawn-out, um, basically kind of a blog-type post. At the bottom of my website, um, yokepincompany.com, there's one that says the true value of vintage supplies. I go on a rampage on what they're really worth, in my opinion. And um, I also give away every, every way that I get vintage supplies when I do want them. Um, don't focus on that, <laughs> please. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to get away from all of those vintage supplies and paying so much for them. Find something modern that works because there's lots and lots of great modern nibs. And, you know, this this whole myth that you got to have a vintage nib to write like the masters is is bull. Um, I tell you what, if, if Madaraz was alive today, I guarantee you could put any nib about in his hand and the quality would be very, very similar. Uh, I don't think that most people in the world would notice it. So, do we have any nib questions? I just wanted to rant a little bit more than anything. <laughs> have any questions about nibs or how they're made or you know they do they do that's right that is absolutely true correct the the greats can make anything work it's it's not like you know you, Picasso if you gave him one brush over another he couldn't paint it's not the way it works you don't know when to ditch nibs okay couple things there's one trick you can do on a very pointed sharp nib yes you do I'll get I'll answer that question next when to change a nib if you take the nib and on the surface of your hand if you rub it up you'll see that this one kind of slides along the surface of my thumb um, if it grabs and pokes and catches 
that's a good indicator that the nib needs replaced. Um, once you become accustomed to a certain nib, you'll, you'll know um, when it, the time is. The, the hairlines, it won't produce fine hairlines. Um, it may flex wrong. It, it, it can do a lot of things, and that's something that experience is going to teach you more than anything else. But use that little thumb trick like I just showed you, and that's a good general indicator of um, the life. Okay, I had another question and I missed it. I'm sorry, I forgot what it was. Ah, yes, angle a nib to paper. That was it. Okay, um, the thing with different nibs is, uh, let's, we'll go with a, take for example, a Leonard Principle. I always go to that one because I like it a lot. And a Nico G. And I think this is a Zebra G, but whatever. Um, same difference pretty much. The, the, you're not going to be able to see it on the phone. But a Leonard Principle is very, very, very sharp. A Nico G is more forgiving because the end is more blunt, basically. So for some, you know, if you're writing with a Nico G and say it's at you know, that angle, when you go to a Leonard principle, you may have to lessen that angle slightly so that it doesn't catch on the paper. And um, that also can vary with the type of writing paper surface you have. You know, if you have a very toothy, rough paper, you may need a less of a slant on it. Um, the thing with a nib, too, is a lot of people will cheat. And I don't mean cheat, basically. They're going to take this nib and they're going to cant it up really steep. Okay, um, there becomes a point when you tip that so far up that instead of I'm going to the instead of writing on the point of the pin, you're going to be writing on the side of the times, and it won't create hairline. So you want to have this angle as steep as possible that's comfortable for you, and also so st steep not so steep that it catches in the paper. And that's another thing you're just going to have to vary. Um, one of the things that someone taught me a long time ago was I started with it way up, and then as I practiced more and more, I bent it down and brought this angle down a little bit each time as I got better. Um, and my fine hairlines improved by doing that. And again, that'll, that'll change depending on the nib you have and how sharp it is. that any other questions you it's your hand should always remain the same you should because because what you're wanting to do is build up that muscle memory so that your hand is always gripping the pen and sitting on the paper at the exact same angle all the time so that's why you have this metal flange is you take um, the metal flange and you give it a twist you can look on my YouTube channel and I show you how to adjust this angle. You basically just twist up this brass part and or down depending on what you want in order to change the nib angle. That's the way you want to do it. You don't want to get used to moving your hand up and down because that that defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do. You're trying to train your hand to have that same same grip, same angle and everything all the time. So change the nib angle of the flange not of your hand itself. Well, I'm glad it did help. It's, it's something that, you know, especially when people are new, that they're chasing the wrong thing. So, and as always, um, that's correct. Colder should fit to you and not you to it. So yeah, so get out there, get out, get some modern day nibs and try them out. Um, yeah, that adjustment is a game changer when you're first learning, especially. Yeah, so try the modern nibs. How many do I nibs do I have? I have 
in my normal rotation, I have, let me count, one, two, three, four. I have four nibs. Um, I have one for straight holder, and then I have three others depending on what type of, of um, writing I'm going to be doing. You don't have to have pliers. The, the pliers are a tool that helps. Um, it's not necessarily something that's necessary. <laughs> Bend the flanges on the pins. It's brass. The, the pliers do help. They make it much easier. Um, and that was what they're created for. But are they absolutely necessary? No. Um, it, it's a tool to help you because they were adjusting nib flanges long before those pliers were around. To ink to paper. It's not a matter of being careful. It's a matter of, of learning. Um, yeah, they're, the pliers are coming. Um, your, your nib, paper, ink combination is going to be you learning. Um, which ink what's what works with what paper, what nib works with what paper. Um, and it's just something for, that experience will te you, teach you. Yeah, and the, uh, the pliers at Paper and Inks will be back in stock in a few weeks. Um, I saw a couple people ask about that. They're, uh, they're coming from manu my manufacturer in Europe, so they're in route. Um, in production and in route, so won't be too long. Yeah, it doesn't take a big fortune to get started in this. I mean, yes, there are, yeah, the inks that eat, eat through nibs, I assume you mean. Um, yeah, iron gall ink especially is very acidic. Um, that's part of it and that's why these are disposable and that's why you shouldn't be paying 30 40 bucks for a nib I mean this is a piece of steel that you th end up throwing away it's not like a fountain pen where you keep it, um, it it's it's just part of it you know the, the acidity of the ink is what helps attach the ink to the paper itself um, so it's just something you have to deal with and there are certain brands of Sumi that are acidic So, but yeah, quit worrying about what everyone else is using for a nib. Find what you like because everyone's different. Difference between straight and oblique holders. It's, there's, yes, okay. Almost all of the hands that we practice today were developed using a pretend this is straight, a straight holder. Um, the oblique was invented in roughly the 1830s, 1840s. And what the oblique is, is, is it is an aid. It's not a requirement of a tool. The oblique for a right-handed person takes, oh, this is going to be hard to demonstrate this way without flipping it around. Basically, pretend um, pretend this line is our slant, and with a straight, a right-hander would not be riding on that slant. So the oblique changes the angle of the nib. It's an aid. Um, I'm actually personally in the process of eliminating el eliminating the oblique use. I'm transitioning over to straight holder Spencerian and straight holder round hand or in grocer script. Um, it's not something you absolutely have to have. It's primarily was made for right handers just to aid in lining up the nib with your slant angle of your letters. Okay. Probably gonna, yep, all straight. I'm gonna be, uh, why I started this, um, I started getting in penmanship because my great great grandfather was a penman and teacher of penmanship, and everything he did was with the straight holder, um, all hands.
chance he did. So that was my initial reason for getting involved in this was family. Um, and I want to continue that and it's kind of an honor to my family, basically, in a sense. So I want to transition and be able to write with a straight holder like he did. And that's my sole purpose in this. I don't, I don't write for, it's difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, the transition from oblique to straight is very difficult because the paper angle is very different. It's very different experience. So I'm not going to crook my wrist. I'm going, what will happen is this, haven't ever tried a quill. Um, I'm not going to crook my wrist. What I'm, what's going to happen is, is I will either change the paper angle or my swells will be different looking. If you look at, for example, one of um, PR Spencer's um, writing samples, the original guy that made a Spencerian script, his Spencerian looks very, very different than what we look at today. And that is because he was writing with a quill, number one, and number two, it's a straight holder. It's not an oblique. So he wasn't able to get those big, thick swells that we see today in most modern Spencerians. So it looks a little bit different. And then the other thing you can do is turn the paper. Mo Okay. swells on the other side that was um what's my favorite script to write i do spencerian and i do engrossers and that's about it um getting so many questions at once sorry <laughs> i'm trying to keep up <laughs> if i missed your question could you repeat it real quick and i'll answer it Oh, swells on the upstroke. That's called, that was um, Italian round, round hand um, reverse caps. Um, they were done in an offhand flourish method. And actually, that's what my great-grandfather did. Um, it was a version of Italian. It was called, it's called American Italian. They would do a reverse um, cap like an Italian, and then they would attach Spencerian lowercase to it. Um, and that was kind of like what he specialized in and did a lot. So that was one of the reasons to start me to want to transition is I want to be able to do that Italian-American. Yep, tried to do one at a time. Okay, straight holders for lefty. That was the one I missing, missed. Okay, most lefties will use a straight holder. Um, from experience in dealing with people all day long, every day, <laughs> uh, most lefties are built naturally. So their hand, when they write, is at that slant. So there's no reason for an oblique. If you hook when you write or something as a lefty, there may be a chance that you need a left-handed oblique or a right-handed oblique to work for that. But 90% of the lefties in the world, and I'm pulling numbers not from fact, but just off the top of my head, um, we'll use a straight holder and there's no reason for an oblique. Um, like I said, the oblique was originally made to aid a right-handed calligrapher, but that's not always the case. You know, you take someone, for example, like uh, Rosemary Buzchek, which I've made a couple pins for, and hers are just absolutely crazy flanges. Um, there's three or four different bins in it. It goes different ways. She's overhooked and underhooked and riding on top. It's kind of crazy. So, for lefties, it's not always absolutely positive, but most will use a straight. Um, someone asked about sharing his work. Uh, the problem is, is it's so fine detail, it doesn't show up well on here. Yeah, that's right. You're that's right. You are. You're you're a lefty and use a right oblique and you turn your paper. So there's no definitive correct answer, but most of the time. I mean it. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is good. To <laughs> As you started your vintage nib website, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not saying discount vintage nibs completely. What I'm saying is don't, don't, um, 
don't rely on them. And if you get them at a good price, then absolutely. Because trust me, I've bought plenty of vintage nibs, but I've also bought them at a good price. So I'm more leaning towards those people that pay the plus, you know, $7 plus for a nib. That's what I'm leaning towards in vintage nib. There's no reason for that. And, I, and, and also, just don't spend your time chasing nibs, you know, just like I said that with that piano analogy at the beginning. It does no good if you don't ever actually put the nib in a pen and write. That's absolutely right. I know you don't, <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> yeah, don't go chasing nib falls. That's right. Um, a nib for a non-calligrapher. A good nib for a non-calligrapher is a Nico G. And um, the reason for that is the tips of them are very round um, and they, they are forgiving to the novice hand. And also, they're, I, I don't know what they're made out of, but that chrome plating on them is the most indestructible stuff on the face of the earth. They outlast other nibs by far. Um, due to that plating they have on them. So Nico G is a great nib if you're just getting into it and want to start and um, learn. If it's you find it's too rounded, try a Zebra G nib. Um, made very, very similar, but slightly more fine-pointed. Yeah, that's it, the Captain America shield. <laughs> Yeah, lots of people use G-nibs. It's probably one of the most popular nibs in the world. I had no idea they were made that long ago. <laughs> yeah. I don't, the, the, the vintage thing won't ever go away. I, I'm just trying to, my whole purpose in this was just reiterate, don't spend all your money and time on them. It's ridiculous. So, any other pin nib questions? That's where my expertise lies, not in the actual writing. Pin holder times for the next scope. Sure, we can do that. Nibs, ooh. For okay, for broad edge, um, pin holder making questions. We'll 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 shoot me an email on your pin holder making questions because usually it ends up being involved. Um, my email is yokepin at gmail .com. Um, For broad edge, I recommend tape, and I say that having. Very, very, very limited experience in broad edge. Um, I told I was told tape by uh, I took a um, chancery italic class workshop, and I was told because they aren't as flexible and they're a little bit easier to get used to, and I had problems with Mitchell's in that class and switched to tape and it helped me, but I never did learn the hand, um, and I decided I was taking on too many. Flange adjustment advice. Flange adjustment, you can get that on my YouTube channel. Um, I have two or three videos for flange adjustments on in YouTube. Um, you can do a simple search on Google for Yoke Pin Company YouTube, and it will take you to my channel, and I have all kinds of videos with how to adjust flanges and pin-related questions. Oh, Lord. <sighs> That's the, the recommendations for effective and safe cleaning for nibs. Um, that's going to be all over the, the place. Um, and I've seen that grow into a debate that <laughs> you just wouldn't believe. Uh, I will tell you what I use myself um, for cleaning my nibs. 
I use water. Um, that's all I use. Um, when it gets very, very dirty or a nib becomes clogged, I have a ultrasonic jewelry cleaner. And I take a solution of warm water, a drop of dish soap. I drop my nibs in there, let them run a couple cycles, um, and then pull them out. And then I dry them off. Yep, I've seen Windex, I've seen ammonia, I've seen all kinds of recommendations. And that's why I said this, this can go on for days, what everyone uses. You know, people use alcohol to dry the water. In the end, I, I just use water because they're going to rust. <laughs> they're going to be thrown away. Um, I try to get as much as I can, life out of them as I can by just wiping them dry um, and cleaning all the ink off of them well. And that ultrasonic is very good for broad nibs because of reservoirs and stuff. Gets all the icky gunk out of the reservoirs. Nibs do you use a year a month? The number of nibs is going to be based upon how much you actually write. Um, how much time the nib spends in the ink. Um, you know, it, I know from like dealing with professional calligraphers that do like envelope and dressing all day long, I know that they can go through several in just an envelope job. So if you're doing that all day long every day, it can be quite a few. What holder can be used with a Hunt 108? Hunt 108 is the crow quill, correct? And it's the odd sized crow quill. correct I no, I don't have all my nib containers near me right now got it in the sampler huh I'd have to I tell you what ask me shoot me an email about the 108 and I'll look do you have a favorite holder yeah um, my this this one is my favorite holder one I made out of Brazilian rosewood. Um, the size is based on a Zanarian fine art writer. Yep. If in doubt on your nibs, just get rid of them. They're disposable. Okay. We're starting to die down here on questions. I will. If it's pins and nibs, I can usually help. Or I know someone that can. So you'll have to go to other people for all the penmanship advice. That's it. When the hairlines are not thin anymore, they're catching paper, throw them away. If you watch the replay you will be able to see what the benefit of an oblique is. I discussed it a little bit earlier. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope that was helpful. Okay. Good night.